Actually, you know what? I think I will start. And okay, then I'll just... uh, and Caesarea by the. No, you're on it. No, my father. David, you get there up too early to pay your bills. <laughs> We're up late last night, very late. Uh, Caesarea Philippi, uh, no, that's, that's where Jesus said there appeared. This is the port that Paul will have, and today um, they have a plaque there out by the water where um, Paul set sail. And he was on trial there. The building, of course, doesn't exist today. And that's where Cornelius was baptized by St. Peter. So we, we were walking around the property on the other side. They have a, a general area where Peter probably baptized Cornelius as one of the first Gentiles into the faith. Because the Jewish people rejected the faith, <coughs> that Paul turned to the Gentiles. The word Gentiles means the what? The nations. Ethne. We get the word ethne. So let's look at verse 24 here. Uh, ch chapter 24, verse 5. He goes through all these trials. And uh, remember Jesus' five trials. That'll be on your final test. We found this man to be a pest. Verse 5. Uh, so uh, in Matthew 11, Jesus is called names. When you don't like somebody, you call them names of, of what they take in. So Jesus is called, and John the Baptist with him in Matthew 11, a wine bibber. And uh, of all things, the Lord is called a glutton. And, if, and these are men fasting and praying every day. So when you when you get when you somebody doesn't agree with you religiously speaking, you attack them, and you attack them in their sometimes their physicality, right? Oh, they're schlub and this. So Paul now gets called a pest there. Verse 5, he creates dissension among Jews all over the world. And circle the word Jews again. Jews is the, the word used for uh, uh, that part of the Jewish uh, religion that attacks the Christian believers. So it's not being anti-Semitic if some have claimed, and when I heard them say it to me, you need to take that out of the Bible. Well, I, I can't take anything out of the Bible, number one. And, and number two, I like it there, and it's staying there. So you got to change the Bible. You can't change the Word of God. This is locked in stuff. So the Jews here mean the, the hostility that's risen when the Gospel is proclaimed. And where do you find that a lot? The Gospel of St. John. Amen? And then... Um, He's a ringleader called the sect of the Nazareans. Now, remember what the word Nazir means? No, no, is this the right one to you? I have it in the trunk of my car. <laughs> I bought new ones. We get the word Nazir again. Does everybody remember that? Yes. And the whole idea of a Nazarene is, remember they said, can anything good come from Nazareth? From yes. Nazareth in uh, John chapter 1. And the whole idea comes from, in the book of Isaiah, a tree stump in uh, Isaiah 11, 1. And then it says, when you look at the stump, there comes a little shoot. And the name of the shoot is called a Nazir. So when you have Jesus being conceived by the Holy Spirit in Nazareth. So when Jesus is born, it's quite, quite impossible for a virgin to give birth, but that's what we believe, right? The virgin birth. And if you don't believe the virgin birth, you are not a Christian, you are not a Catholic. You must believe in the virgin birth. And you know what? People go to church and they don't believe in it. <laughs> Can you help me out on that one, please? So here, here comes the Nazir. And so from, from there to... Uh, comes in Matthew 2, 23, I think we were looking at that uh, last time too, is out of, out of Egypt, out of, there's, he shall be called a Nazarene. So one of the first names that we're all called, does everybody know we were called Nazarenes before? We had many towns. What's the first town? The people of the way. way. Okay. What, what's another name? We were called Nazarenes. 
So here, here now, and what did Jesus have on the cross? I and R I. Remember that? Anybody have a crucifix in your bedroom? And I and R I means Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Now Nazareth uh, is a Roman garrisoned town. It's where the Holy Family heard the message that you, you got to go to Bethlehem. And Mary said, Mary said, I am pregnant and you got to move. And, and on Donkey Express, right? We don't know what was a donkey. They usually walked back then. <laughs> it was about 90 months. <coughs> Verse number 6. He even tried to desecrate our temple. Now, how did he try to desecrate the temple? By bringing somebody in that's a what? A Gentile. So, back then, you're not supposed to bring anybody into, into there. And how many know we did that kind of in the church a little bit too? Who are you? If you look different, you dress different, we, we want to know who you were. Does that still go on? Yes. Yes. Yes, it does. So, this, this was, the man that they brought in was called Trophimus. Trophimus. So, uh, he would try to desecrate our temple, but we arrested him. I remember we just had that big uh, fight going on. If you examine him, you will be able to learn from him yourself about everything of which we are accusing him. The Jews, now, what did the Jews have difficulty is getting two people to agree. Now, wh why is it important you got to agree? Because in the book of Deuteronomy 21, you have to have agreement. Deuteronomy 21, Deuteronomy 22, you have to have agreement before someone's accused. They had no agreement. What was the problem with Jesus? They arrested him at night, which was forbidden to try somebody at night. So when Jesus is being tried, it's a nighttime, uh, 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 and they should have waited till the next day, but they couldn't wait till the next day because the Passover was coming. And they wanted to get him done, and, and so they, they, they rushed this court, it was against their law, and then they said, we need some accusers, and one said one thing, and one said another thing. And when, when, they, when they set Jesus up, and, and Paul's facing similar things, they, they, there was a semicircle, and that was the Sanhedrin back then, remember, the 70 members? 35 were on this side, 35 were on this side, and Caiaphas sat there, the Grand Poobah. Remember Caiaphas? And then, the Lord Jesus was right in the center there. And so, and who did you have there? You had the Democrats and the Republicans there, remember that? Yeah. And so, you had the Sadducees, and the Pharisees, and they hated each other. Isn't that great? Okay? So we're all of the same religion, but we can't stand each other. Isn't that great? The liberals and the conservatives and the, and the orthodox and the unorthodox, they're all sitting together, right? How many, how many, and then there is, on the political front, this really gets more intriguing as we go along, there was a man called Punches, Pilate, okay, he was very punchy, and then uh, next to him, there was a, a, a person in town, he couldn't stand, um, but because of Jesus, they agreed to do it, and his name was Herod. Okay? So, look what's going on when Jesus is being tried. Two groups that can't stand each other. Two, two uh, politicians that can't stand each other. Uh, and, and this is really great. So, Paul is facing some of the same... Paul is facing some of the same thing. Remember, he just said, I am a Pharisee. Now, being a Pharisee was not a bad thing. The word Pharisee means... Uh, the word Pharisee in Hebrew is perushim. Everybody say perushim. And it means, it means separated one. There were 6,000 Pharisees. And in order to be a Pharisee, you had to be a man over 30 years old. Um, in the book of uh, Luke chapter 3, verse 20, Jesus was 30 when he began to preach. And he had to wait to that ripe old age. 18 years under the auspices of Mary and Joseph in the town called Nazareth. So Paul now is experiencing the same heat of the day. And by the way, should we experience the same heat? And where is going? To, where are you going to find your most trouble? Ready? Inside the church. Anybody Amen. know what I'm talking about? Yeah. 
inside the church, you're going to have your enemies, you're going to have people that don't like you, you're going to have clergy that can't stand you. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay? And they're going to be talking about you, and they're going to give you a one-way ticket back to Seoul, Korea. I mean, these are, these, are the, these are the interesting, and you just want renewal and revival. So all of this is going on. When we study St. Paul now, all of that's going on again. And guess what? All of it's going on again right now. Amen? So what do I hear every single day of my life? I hear church stories. I hear what you heard in preaching on Christmas Day. I hear all these stories. And I just go, oh. I just heard one where it was that the people went to church on Christmas and they heard about bicycles. Isn't that wonderful? You know, you better thank God what you get, amen, if you got good same. How many would like to go to church and hear about bicycles? All right. The Jews also joined in the attack, and uh, uh, verse 9, and asserted these things were so. So, what happens when you're under crowd control? When somebody gets up there and says something, <coughs> does something really good, or really, really, what does the crowd say? Yeah, 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 yeah. And they go, yeah, 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 yeah. They go, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so what happens, what happens is you see, you see that, that the crowd really gets into it and they don't know what they're saying either. It's like being in the third deck at Yankee Stadium and uh, you, you see your favorite player and he was safe and even though he was out by a mile, but you can't say because you're on the third deck at Yankee Stadium eating your, your, your beef sandwich. The verse 10, and then the governor motioned him to speak and Paul replied, I know that you've been a judge over the nation for many years, so I'm pleased to make my defense before you. How, how do you say it? Defense? Apology. Okay. Now, an apology, you owe me an apology. Did you ever hear that one? The word, the word means you owe me a defense of why that action took place. And so when we give an apology, it's called the defense. I, what well, was a ro 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 Right? I mean, it's hard to admit you're wrong. And, uh, and because I'm giving you a defense of my life, then I gotta say, S -s sorry. And how many of it's really hard to say I'm sorry to people? Nobody discovered that yet? And so, Paul now comes not to give a, I'm sorry, but he comes to give the real meaning of the word. I'm gonna tell you what I believe. Now, you're on trial. How many would tell people what you really, really believe? How many tell people what you really, 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 really think? <laughs> what, 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 did you, what, what, did, what did that movie Jim Carrey he had to he could not tell a lie and so imagine, imagine if we all told everybody what we really thought imagine if Cosmolini told David what you really thought oh my heavens can you imagine what bliss they would have okay now Verse 11, as you can verify, not more than 12 days have passed and I went up to Jerusalem to worship. Now remember, when, go, when you go to Jerusalem, you gotta go what? Up. Oh. Up. Where is he? He's in Caesarea. Where's Jerusalem? If you look at your maps? It's down. It's down, so where does he say? I went up to Jerusalem. By the way, in Hebrew, when you go up to Jerusalem, and I just, I just read that in the secular press. It's called Aliyah. It's called Aliyah. When you go to Jerusalem, you make Aliyah. How do you spell that? A-L-I-Y-A-H. And that is, and, and if, you, if you circle the word Aliyah there, and you're, you're thinking, every one of us has to make a journey to Jerusalem. Uh, the, the journey to Jerusalem is not necessarily going there, though I do recommend it. And by the way, the Wailing Wall, you ever been to the Wailing Wall? Peter took like uh, 27,328 <laughs> pictures of it. When you, the Wailing Wall is in East Jerusalem. And that's where the, the Palestinians say it's their capital. So when we were by the Wailing Wall, we were in East Jerusalem. So there's West Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, and, and you know that controversy brewing now. And so if you circle the word Aliyah, uh, or write down the word Aliyah, it's a word meaning that I have to be on a journey, on a pilgrimage. So what does Paul say here? I went to Jerusalem. And he goes, I went, look at your maps. I went up to Jerusalem. But wait a minute. 
It looks like he went down to Jerusalem. You, you, you got the language? Elevation, right. Because in, in, the, in the time of Solomon, who lived in the ripe old age of uh, 932 BC, when Solomon is, is living during this time period, he um, establishes, by God's direction, Jerusalem and the temple, and God then put, does something incredible. He puts his name there. So everything is going up to Jerusalem. I, I, I should do a, a, a give you a, a map. So maybe we could do a little interim study on all the hills of Jerusalem. It's very fascinating, all the hills of Jerusalem, the seven hills of Jerusalem. Which, and then I, I do a study all the gates of Jerusalem and study Jerusalem and everything, because it's, it's a hot button issue right about now. So does everybody understand the language? I love the language. When I discovered that in my Bible, I, I went nuts. I said, what a beautiful thing. I went up to Jerusalem. Amen. And that's called Aliyah. In the secular papers, uh, uh, yesterday so I was reading, Jews from are, are leaving Europe, by the way. A lot of Jews are leaving Paris because they're being persecuted there. And what are the Jews saying in Paris right now? We see the handwriting on the wall. And we are getting out while there is time. So what are we doing? They're leaving Paris and they're relocating in Israel. And so that's why they got to build all those settlements and more settlements to house all these people and being in influence. And also Russia too, they're, they're seeing a lot of handwriting on the wall. So the Jews are, are bailing toward, um, toward Israel. So that's a So when you, when you go on a journey to, when, you, when you're on, if David finally takes you there, when you finally go to, uh, when you finally bypass the Dominican Republic and you head into uh, uh, Tel Aviv, you're on Aliyah. And the whole sense of Aliyah too is when you go up, when you go up, you've got to come in a certain way. You've got to go up the mountain. And when you go up the mountain, and you've got to look over the city. Well, if you've ever, you ever been to Israel, Jerusalem the first time, what we tried to do for you, and then, then um, last time we went to Jerusalem, do you remember, ma'am? Do you remember it was nighttime when you arrived in Jerusalem? Yes, I do. It was, it, it was a little chilly. <laughs> Not like this, Freezing. but it was chilly. I remember it was chilly. Freezing. And what what it was, and I had to I had to say to the to uh, Saliba, our guide, I said, Saliba, make sure you get the wine for them, because when you come into Jerusalem, you're always looking at a panorama view here in front of it, where where our Lord died and rose and is coming again. What do you got to do? You got to drink a glass of wine. So you know, little little taste of wine. So you got to lift your wine over Jerusalem. Okay, so that so all of you have done that. Did you do that, Brother Peter? When you've done that, you you then uh, I don't think they told you this, but you were doing aliyah. You were going up to Jerusalem. Okay, so I, I just I just want to give you that background. So and it's important now. If you go with me to verse number um, twelve, neither the temple nor the synagogues nor anywhere in the city did they find arguing with anyone or instigating a riot among the people. So Paul always preached Christ crucified, didn't he? And, uh, and uh, in, in recent years, uh, things have come to light that what I've done even 20 years ago, and they said to me, you started problems by preaching Christ. So I said, what do you want me to do, move to Brooklyn? <laughs> Nor can they prove to you the accusations they're now making against me. So here they come, because you gotta get what degree? Two people agree, Deuteronomy 21, Deuteronomy 22. By this I admit to you that according to the way, okay, underline that. See, what do they call us? The way. The way. Now, what does Jesus say in John chapter 14, verse 6? I am the way, the truth, and the life. So here's what they say in Hebrew. We are the the We are the direct. It sounds like somebody for the Yankees that used to was very famous that Peter saw him on the upper deck of the for all the past thirty years. Derek. So what does Derek's name mean? The way. That's the Hebrew rendition, okay? The the way. So we're called the way. We call it and because everybody understand why John fourteen and six. Amen? Now what do they do? Look at this verse number fourteen. They called it a sect. Uh, a sect is a, like a subdivision. Because how many groups of Jews were they in the first century? 
five. You got all the groups of Jews in the first century? Okay, review. There was the Sadducees. There were the Pharisees. There were the Sadducees. There were the Essenes. And then there were the Christians who were Jewish. So those are the five groups of people in, and can I add a sixth one on? There's, a, there's what is called the Ebionites, I told you before. The Ebionites means those who go for it, worked with the poor. So those were six groups of Jews. And now we have this big one that's called these Christians. Acts 11 is the first time we have the word Christian mentioned. And it was a mocking term. What was the first mocking term was the Nazarenes. So he belongs to this sect. What's a sect? Somebody who broke away from us. There's a difference between a sect and a cult. Okay, the Mormons, the Jehovah's, they're cults. Sometimes we call them a sect. A sect is uh, somebody who, who believes basically what we believe, but they have varying views and they're living in a desert somewhere. So we'd say, a sect has formed. In, in where I was in Middletown, New Jersey. Anybody ever hear of Middletown? Yeah. No. There's a sect forming there, and a Catholic sect. And here's the main church, and you go down the street by Route 36, and it looks very Catholic on the outside, but they said, the, the father, quote unquote, says, we accept everybody here. And, and you know what that means, when we accept everybody here. Whatever you, whatever your background is, whatever your sexuality is, come on in, okay? So there's no like preaching of uh, calling sin, sin there. And one woman said to me on Christmas day, we have a great church, but you probably wouldn't like it because in our church, they accept everybody. Dig, 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 okay? <laughs> dig, 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 dig. So a sect, is someone who generally believes what we believe, but there are varying views. So what happens in this church in Middletown, they, <coughs> they tell the populace, we are Catholics. Are they? Perhaps, but I, I don't know if he's a real priest or whatever, or an ex-priest or whatever, a Y priest or a Z priest, but they're having some type of mass going on there. And because the, the majority of people do not want study very well or know very well, they'll say, oh, I went to that church by Route 36. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so then that's called a sect. So they are a sect. Are everybody with me? I believe that everything that's in accordance with the law and written in the prophets. Now, if you underline there verse number uh, 14, Paul, sa Paul says there that he's thoroughly Jewish. Remember to be Jewish, scripturally speaking, you got to believe in the TNK. Remember the TNK? Mm -hmm. T is for the what? Torah. 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 The N is for the Nebi and the prophets. Ketuvim. And the Ketuvim are the other writings like the Psalms. So TNK. I believe in the Torah, I believe in the, the prophets, and I believe in all the other writings. But guess what? The Jewish people then and today don't focus on the prophets. So when you go up to a Jewish person and say, uh, my friend, uh, can you tell me about Isaiah 53, which really talks about the crucifixion. They get a little jittery with you. Can you tell me what that means? I asked my friend, the rabbi, what it meant and I immediately when I asked him that I saw he was uncomfortable I got a quick answer what it meant very quick I just want to hear what you say it meant so I can be accurate in, in telling the world what you believe so now we're going to be focused so we circle there the law and the prophets so this is this is what I believe verse 15 I have the same hope in God as they themselves, that there will be a resurrection of the righteous and the unrighteous. Now, Paul's main preaching, Paul 
Paul's main, main preaching was the resurrection. Now, if you underline the word resurrection, notice he says there, the righteous and the unrighteous. Now, this is called the general resurrection. Everybody will resurrect. Everybody will resurrect. Everybody. Some to eternal life and some to damnation. If you're going to be damned, you get your, your body back and, and, and destruction. Those of us who live righteously for God, you get his body and a newness of life. How many need a new body right about now? Somebody needs I need a, a new hand. Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. Jackson here needs a new, uh, hand. A, a, a new, a new hand, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's the right, so everywhere Paul's main teaching, wherever he could, is Jesus is alive. Is that your main teaching? Do you go like this a lot? Jesus is alive. So if you, if you put a big star there, that's his main teaching. Now the general resurrection, we're all going to be there. And if you have a living relationship with Christ, you're saved. If you don't, and you can't go through the motions. This is, this is where my big fighting is. People are people going through the motions of people who aren't even in. Because people who are out don't want to come in because they see people upstairs going through the motions. And there's no change of heart, but what we call a transforming life. Verse 16, because of this, I always strive to keep my conscience clear. Okay, because of the general resurrection, that's in John 5, by the way, too. John 5, because of the general resurrection, and Jesus mentions that the voice will be called out, and all those, the graves will be what? Open. open. Now, before the great second coming of the Lord, the graves will be opened. And those, those who are dead will get their brand new bodies. Anybody need a brand new body? Mm -hmm. You need one right about now? So, Paul, Paul here says to us there, my conscience is clear. I'm ready for that. Remember he says back in Acts 20, I'm ready for it. I did not shrink from telling you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. My conscience is clear. And every church I go to, I want to make sure I tell them that there's a real heaven and there's a real hell. I want to tell them that sin is sin. I want to preach to them, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. So whatever town I visit, for however long I'm in that town, I want to say, I want to say, I told them. I told them, Lord. I told them the, the, the truth. So how many here have a clear conscience? Say you work in UPS. Did you tell them all there? You did. Well, Brother Peter. Brother Peter is a good evangelist. Yes. And you, you know who shocks me as an evangelist? My brother. He has a very big thing about telling everybody you got to go to church. He he doesn't get much into who he, he says Jesus is God. He believes that, but he just says you got to get back to God. You got to get back to so that's every every day he says to people you got to get back to God. That's, that's all he says. You got to get back. To God. That's right. Yeah. So he's an evangelist with one line. <laughs> Better than no lines. <laughs> well, that's the right line. So how many here? How many here have a clean conscience? Verse seventeen. After many years, I came to bring alms for my uh, for my nation and offerings. While I was so engaged, now giving alms is is. Uh, remember, we had someone giving alms, Cornelius. Giving alms, the book of Daniel says, helps to atone for your sins. It means when you give alms, this is not, this is not your regular collection upstairs, because that's kind of expected of you. Giving alms is like a Zacchaeus, when you go out of your way. So when, when Paul says, I'm giving alms, what's he saying to you? Ouch. I, yeah. He's saying, I'm not living the normal life that everybody, I give alms. Now, when you, when you hear Jesus is preaching in Matthew 6, it's required of every believer here to give alms. That means, sir, you give in your collection, but when there's a need, you cough up the extra. Cough, baby, cough. <laughs> As you had all your water, now just cough, amen? So, giving alms, so what, what does Paul declare? I give alms. I give alms. Because I want to show you that I just don't go through this religion. I go out. Amen? 
So I believe as, as, as faithful men and women of God that we are, I believe you are the men and women who like to give the extra and you don't count the cost. Amen? You're counting the cost? You can't count the cost, you just say out chala. So, verse 18, while I was so engaged, they found me, and after my purification in the temple without a crowd or disturbance. So, Paul, Paul was, they found me, and they're arresting me, verse 19, but some Jews in the province of Asia, remember Asia Minor, okay? Everybody look at your map, you can see Asia Minor over there, remember? It's not Asia, it's not the Philippines, okay? It's not in Japan. And uh, who should dare be before here to make whatever accusation they might have against me? Now, if you're a Christian, you're going to be accused. Yes? Yes. All right, hold your spot with me, and let me, let me show you our accusations. Go with me to 1 Peter 4. Peter, go to Peter. Who wrote Peter? Peter. Peter. You are getting smarter in your old age. I can tell that you're here. 1 Peter 4. I alluded to that before, 1 Peter 4. Good stuff? Someone took Peter out of my Bible. Would you put it back in, please? And I won't be mad at you. If I am 1 Peter? All right, I found Peter. All right, 1 Peter 4, did you go there? Yeah. Now, if you scoot all the way down to 1 Peter 4. Verse 13. First Peter 4, 13. Now, as believers in Jesus, and, and Peter's writing this, he's writing this about the year 62 AD. This is the time when he's ready to be turned upside down and crucified. And I had the incredible blessing of being in the prison that he was in. And Paul was in that same prison. And when I, when I go to Rome with you, I, I will... I it's it's yeah. never part of a tour. I will make sure that's part of the tour. You've got to see this prison. You're in that prison? Mm -hmm. Remember going downstairs? Yes. I think the church on the top is called St. Joseph's. They have a little church where they have a little chapel. Yes, I, 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 I loved it. I, I just wanted to stay in there all day and pray, but I didn't. But let's look at how to really be accused. Now, look at verse 13. Everybody with me? Yes. Chapter 4, 1 Peter. Now, who is going to harm you if you're enthusiastic for what is good? Are you all enthusiastic for the gospel? Yes. But if, even if some of you should suffer because of righteousness, what is righteousness? We're living the faith. We're honorable men and women here. And somebody on your Christmas celebration did not like that. That you're honorable. That you're really living for your faith. <sighs> <sighs> you get the eyes in your Christmas celebration. <sighs> But even though you should be suffer for because of righteousness, for living for God, blessed are you. And, uh, and by the way, right in there, there's another beatitude. What, what beatitude was that? The last beatitude, blessed are you who what? Suffer. So remember St. Peter heard that on the what? Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. He was there. And, and so look what happens there. He kind of quotes it again, doesn't it? Then he says to us, verse 15, But sanctify Christ as Lord. Make God so holy in your life, in your hearts. Always be ready to give an uh, apologia. Always ready to st st stand defense. Now, when you stand defense for Jesus, what's, what's the word? Apology, right? When you stand defense, here's what Jesus said to us in Matthew chapter 10. Do not prepare beforehand what you're going to say. God will give you the words. And listen to what Jesus says. This is an outstanding thing that our Lord says. The Spirit of my Father will give you the words. Whoa. That's the, one of the first times, the only times that the Holy Spirit has been called the Spirit of the Father. So, how many just wanted to bless somebody? And uh, you want to really let them have it. And you want to stand up for the faith that you believe in. What should you do? How many have ever rehearsed all your talks before? I've got to get all these points down and maybe I should use these little cards. When you, when you are coming in for your faith, be one ready to allow the Spirit to come in. One day there was a man coming and he says to me, you're very unusual. 
and he says, I'm, I was a, a Catholic and I want my fiance to be a Presbyterian with me. And so what he did at St. Antoninus, he brought his pastor in. And um, I knew how they would come in with their Bibles and everything else. I said, what should I do? Should we do Bible ping pong? Ding, 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 ding. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to ask the Lord. And I listened to him. And I gave, I gave answers, hopefully, in the spirit. And they got back in the car to one another. And they said, I've never heard anybody like that before. The man who was trying to say to me, let my fiance become a Presbyterian, guess what happened? He became a Catholic. He says, he says, he came back and he's one of the strongest Catholics I've ever met. And guess what he's doing to his mother? He brought his mother into he brought his mother into the Presbyterian faith. He says, Mom. We're going back. <laughs> and guess what happened? Guess what his pastor did? His, his, uh, 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 what he just said is incredible. The pastor excommunicated him and says, you can't be one of them anymore. And he says, I gotta go back, it's true. So he, he left his Presbyterian church. So I relied on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave the words to me based on this. So, how am I ready? Are you ready, Peter? UPS is dawning on you tomorrow. Verse 16, but do it with gentleness and reverence. So, when you see Paul, it's with gentleness and reverence. Verse 16, keeping your conscience clear. Did we just hear that? Yes. Keeping your conscience clear. What did Paul say? When I preach the gospel to you, and you preach the gospel, you've got to have a clear what? Conscience. Your lifestyle's got to be honorable in front of the people that you preach to. Amen? You've got to be living it. So if, if you underline that, you can see clear conscience. And by the way, there's another chapter on conscience. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews the 10th chapter. And then he says, so that, you are, you, so that when you are maligned, are you going to be maligned? Shake your head yes. Are they going to say you're this, you're that? Yes. When you are maligned, those who defame your good conduct in Christ may themselves be put to shame. Because here's why. You and I, in Christ, we're going to live lives that are honorable, above board, and consistent. When people malign us and say five years down the pike, we're still the same uh, honorable men and women. They're like, wow. And look at your life. Look at your life. A, a man told me of his sinful... I, I, I bring out the worst in people. The man told me of his sinful habits. And uh, I told him not to do that. And he, and he told me... He, he came confessing to me out loud. And uh, it wasn't the sacrament. And he says, I, I did it again. And he says, you know what? I'll go to confession. I told him, you, you're messing with fire, man. For it is better... To, look, underline verse 17. It is underline, uh, it's better for you to suffer for doing good than... If that be the will of God, then for doing evil. So, so when, when Paul is standing on these trials, and this is how to be tried, okay? That you've got to stand there, you've got to stand with your faith, because the greatest moments of your life, number one, and you're not going to like this, is when you're down and out. And then when you begin to look up, the second moment, greatest moments of your life is when people are attacking you. Oh, I don't really like this. Can, you, can we change the subject? And when you defend your faith in Jesus Christ. Whoa, yeah, that's, 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 the, that's the greatness coming. Then your light is shining, Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Then your light is shining before men. So, or verse number 20. These men themselves state what crime they have discovered when I stood before the... Sanhedrin. Here's the Sanhedrin. 35 on this side, 35 on that side. The Grand Poopa in the center. The Sadducees, Pharisees, amen. Um, and then the, the political powers over there. So, are we going to stand before political powers? Yes. Are we going to stand before religious powers? Yes. Are we going to be attacked in our own church? Yes. Are people going to call us wine bippers and gluttons? Yes. Are, are they going to attack you around the third deck of Yankee Stadium? Yes. Okay. So, how many feel a little normal right now? 
Now, please, brothers and sisters, I don't like this, but that's going to happen to us, right? Yeah. You understand when I say I want to go into a cave in the Dominican Republic? Do you understand what I'm saying? I, I just want to get away. But th this is this is our life. This is our trial time. And then, if, if you and I were to complain to the Lord, say, why am I being tried? Why do I have a church that doesn't like me? Yes. And I'm the pastor. <laughs> why? Why do I got to go through this? Because this is what the master went through. And then you got to learn to shake your, your sandals off. And does everybody remember what shaking your sandals off means? Yeah. It means when you come into unbelieving territory and you want to go back to holy living, you don't want what they have, so it's shake, shake their dust. Amen? Are you getting the picture? Verse number 22. Then Felix, not the cat, then Felix, who was accurately informed about the way, what's, what's the Christian called, the direct? Well, then actually informed about the way, who was accurately informed, postponed the trial, saying, when Lysias, the commander, comes down, I shall decide your case. What does it mean he's coming down? Where is he? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Did you get the hint? He's injured when he comes down. Because where did all that beating happen to Paul? In Jerusalem. Remember he had hundreds of people walk him all the way down for 64 miles? What a criminal Paul was, right? And I believe soon in this country it's going to be a criminal to announce the faith. I told you my little exploits in Canada. I'm supposed to go there in 2018 to preach up there. And I said to them in Vancouver, is it safe up here? Can I really preach and belt it out? She said, yeah. Can I call Sin Sin up here? She said, yeah. I said, after I preach, just have a taxi ready to get me across the border. <laughs> Because when I was in Canada the last time, I said things based on the truth of the faith, and guess what happened? Should I have said it? Yes. Did they, but what did Canadian law tell me not to do? Don't say it. Did I say it? Yes. I ran across the bridge. So when I preach in Canada, have the car ready. Get me on a private jet and get me out of Canadian airspace as fast as you can. Amen. And David will pick me up at the airport. So now, and, and by the way, the, the priests there don't wear collars anymore. They, they look like every other person there. So, this is going to happen, okay? This is normal, okay? So, if we say to each other, you know, my church, they did this to me, they said this. Guess what? Welcome to normal living. Oh, you got it? Welcome to normal living. Amen. That's why we do this. That's why we're trying to form a community among ourselves so we can preach the truth of the gospel, preach our, the ways of the faith. Amen. That's what we're trying to do upstairs and have our, our faith back in, in many ways, which you are already seeing. Next, he says there, look at verse with me 20. Uh, everybody understand the Sanhedrin? Yes. How did the Sanhedrin come about? In the book of Exodus, chapter 18. Jethro said to Moses, Mo, it's very difficult for you to uh, talk to two and a half million people. You need help. And we got how many elders? Seventy. See them? And they're going to help you do judging. And guess what Jesus was and Paul was? And products of the Sanhedrin. So did, did Paul meet the Sanhedrin? Yes. How many trials is he going through? This is number two. Verse number 23. I shall decide your case. He gave orders that the centurion, what's a centurion? A leader of what? 100. Did Jesus have a centurion? Yes. Where was the centurion? At the cross. What did, they, what did he say at the cross? This man is truly the son of God. Remember? And, it, it, and the custom has some liberty, and he should not prevent any of his friends caring for the needs. Now, uh, verse 24, we're in, what town are we in? Caesarea. Everybody see your map? Caesarea. Several days later, Felix came in with Drusilla. Doesn't that, you like that name, Drusilla? You can't make up these names. 
you know, every time I see that, I see like Mrs. Dracula. <laughs> Drusilla, who was Jewish. Now, what happened here is um, we have Felix, Felix and Drusilla. What name is Felix? What does Felix mean? It means happy, right? Yes. And Drusilla. She is a Jewess. Now, what has happened is this: a lot of the leaders. A lot of the leaders were Jewish, but it was just in name. How many ever heard of this man? Herod? Remember with John the Baptist, was he Jewish? Yes, he was Jewish, but it was just kind of a... He was an Edomite. He was an Edomite, right. And he, and he was Jewish, and so it really didn't matter. So now we have Felix and Drusilla together. Now watch what Paul is going to do here. He's going to do something which is so tantamount, and I believe this is the secret of talking to Jewish people. Now the Jewish people love when you and I mention Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Just for, you, just for your, your, your notes is the Jewish people don't know the Bible at all. Only 3% practice the faith. So you're going to deal with the 97% out there who don't know it. 97% don't know what you're going to be talking about. So guess what? You know more of the Old Testament than they do. Did you know that? Okay? They, they, they are, and, and remember, they have all their different breakdowns of groups right today. Next he says there, I love this section, because here comes now the, uh, the time when we really got to get into getting to the right point. Several days later, Felix came in with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. He had Paul summoned and listened to him about the faith in Christ Jesus. So if you underline that, box it in. He listened to the faith in Christ Jesus, what Jesus really means. Now, when you're, you and I are really exposed, the real exposure of each of us is to tell the world what Jesus means. What's Paul's main teaching? The resurrection. So now he comes to this part of faith, and this is, this is Romans chapter 1, this is Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 1, verse 5, faith and obedience is our salvation. Remember, you can't just say you believe, you've got to believe and obey. Okay? Faith, so a lot of people say, well, I believe in Jesus, but you can't be living what kind of lifestyle you want. So it's faith and obey. Amen? It's living, it's living in, in, in the faith. Uh, I, I just did a, um, a wake where the young man died of 42 years old. And uh, I, I, I was curious, I went up to the main desk and I said, how did he die? Drug overdose. And, um, and the lady behind the desk says, don't tell them, don't mention that. I said, I don't say, oh, your son who died of a drug? Oh, no, I said, I don't know. That's, that's not how I present the, the talk. And I presented about living your faith and dying in grace. And one guy walking me out to the parking lot says, you preached the gospel, you did. <laughs> And uh, I said, I hope he's with God. He says, yeah, yeah, I hope so too. I hope there was some mercy in there and I hope he gave his heart to God somehow. Okay, so we don't know. I hope that young man is, uh, it's too young to die at 42, amen? So uh, he had pulled someone and listened to him, look under line verse 24. But as he spoke about righteousness, what does righteousness mean? Living, allowing God to live his life through you. Remember the Greek word? Diakosune. Diakosune. See, a lot of people are going through the motions. But you've got to, now, can I test to see if you're a Christian? You've got to be transformed. What does that mean? Can I go a little deeper with you? You can't be doing the same thing every single day. You can't be praying the same way every day. You gotta go deeper. You gotta be seeking more. You gotta go deep, deep, deep. The other day I was drinking my green tea and one man says, hey, tell me about Christmas. And it was right in Dunkin' Donuts. I said, Jesus is alive, he's born. And so I'm, I'm preaching in Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> He asked, I told him. Okay, so 
Paul preaches on righteousness, and what's that mean? You've got to be transformed. Because you are people who have the Holy Spirit in you, I'll, 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 I'll interview you. Is it the same old, same old? Did you do the same old for 2017? Or did you have a transforming life? When you started there, are you different because you got closer to Christ? Are you being transformed? I'll test you later. Hmm. And then you all better test me, okay? And so righteousness and self-restraint and the coming judgment. Whoa! Would you, would you put a little note in there? Paul's preaching the whole gospel. You know, a lot of times I say this. Most people I meet in the church, outside the church, they don't believe there's a judgment day coming. One man confessed to me recently, I committed a sacrilege. But that's okay, God will take care of that. I'm like, you don't believe there's a judgment day coming, man. You don't believe in the judgment. And my pizza, man, I don't take pizza anymore. I'll let Peter do that. Uh, and uh, he says to me, ah, uh, God will get me in, but he's not living the righteous life. Does he care to you right now? No. Am I still announcing it? Yes. And what do I say? There's a real judgment day coming. The coming judgment. Now this goes all the way back to book of Acts chapter 3. Travel with me to Acts chapter 3. Who wrote Acts? Alright, get your Acts together. Now, here's what I would like to do, but I, I don't do it. But here's what I think about doing, but I won't do it. I'd like to talk to everybody I can and let them tell me about their lifestyles, but I don't do it. Do I plan to do it? No. And then hear them tell me about their lifestyles, and guess what I would say to them? You shouldn't be doing that. And guess, so guess what people will say? I'll stay in my... Now go with me to Acts 3, please, verse 15. Acts 3, verse 15. See, we're coming to the whole book of Acts when we do an Acts. You know what <laughs> Acts 3, 15. The author of life you put to death. Now, here's St. Peter doing something we were told in the seminary don't ever do. You. You did that. Now, what's wrong with that picture? What about you? So you have we, and then I told you you have the lettuce sermons. You have lettuce and tomato sermons, lettuce. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right, you, 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 look, that's really a strong word to say, right? The author of life, you put to death, but God raised him, there's, there's the resurrection again. You got that? Raised him from the dead of this we are witnesses, verse 16, and by faith in his name, underline that, verse 16, this man whom you see and know, his name has made strong, and the faith that comes through has given him perfect health in the presence of you all. Now, and this, and this is the point I want to share with us. Now I know, brothers, you acted out of ignorance. How do you say ignorance? Out of your mind. You are out of your mind when you don't know how to get to heaven. Did you know that? You are out of your mind. That's called agnoia. We get the word agnostic. You have an agnostic then. And then he says to us there, but God has brought this to fulfillment that he has announced beforehand through the mouth of all the prophets. Now, what is Paul going to preach to Felix? Got to talk about the prophets. Do the Jews like talking about the prophets? No. Do they believe in the prophets? Yes. Do they talk about it? No. My rabbi friend was fixated on the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and he's also fixated on one or two passages from the prophets. And I'm like, after being with him for 14 years, I said, where's the rest of them? He never mentioned the rest of them. Ever. Ever. Never mentioned the rest of them. And I just went, hmm. <laughs> Verse 19, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be wiped out. Verse 20, and the Lord may grant you times of refreshment and send you the Messiah already appointed to you. Look at verse 21. Whom heaven must receive until the times of universal restoration. And what's the universal restoration? Judgment day. So, what are we here being preached? 
there is a real judgment day coming. Now, who's on trial? Paul's, Paul can be killed in a second. He could be stoned. He could be whipped. He could be quartered and hung. And, but he's boldly says that. Yes. A thought? Okay. Next, back with me to uh, chapter 24, please. Chapter 24. You may now go. When I find opportunity, I shall summon you again. Felix became frightened. He, he was frightened and said these words. Verse 26. At the time, he hoped that the bribe would be offered him by Paul, and he was sent for him very often. Give me money and, uh, you know, slide something to me, and you can be free. But uh, bribery is not the way to go. Two years passed, and Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. So where's Paul? He's, he's, he's hanging around. And, and so now here comes another trial. No, you want to... Here comes another trial. You see the, all the trials bouncing? Felix in Jerusalem, now comes Portius Festus. Wishing to ingratiate himself with the Jews, Felix set Paul in prison. So Paul was in Caesarea, see Caesarea? And you go right in by Caesarea, two years. So that, that's a long time, isn't it? Now we come to, this is, this is like my favorite part, when we, when we come to the, what he says here. Three days, hello, three days? Anybody know three days? Yes. What happens in the Bible when you read three days? Resurrection. All the time you hear three days. You're going to hear something of life coming there. You got it? Every time you see that expression, three days, something, something magnificent is going to happen. Verse 1, three days after his arrival in the province, Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem. All right, see the going up again? See the Aliyah? Yeah. Where the chief priests and the Jews were to presented themselves for the formal charges against Paul. So, I mean, they're getting a array of all these uh, hoi polloi. They asked him as favor to him, gave him, sent to Jerusalem, where they were planning to kill him along the way. Do you remember that? Yes. Look at, underline there, verse 3, along the way. Hello, are you seeing this in there? You, you, see, you see the double meaning in there? Look at verse 4. Festus replied that Paul was being held in custody in Caesarea, and he himself would be returning there shortly. He said, verse 5, let your authorities come down with me. See, come down. Even though they're going what? Up. Come down with me, and this man has done something improper. Let him accuse him. So how long is Paul's trial? A long time, aren't they? The, the, I mean, these are years of trials. And so he's probably under a, a, some type of house arrest. When we get to, to Acts 28, we're going to see he's under house arrest. And sometimes we feel like, oh, uh, I, I look at the church and we've just been following the great Spanish saints. I can't believe what the Carmelites did to John of the Cross. Mm. <laughs> My mouth is hanging open what they did to him. Because he wanted to reform the Carmelites and say, we can't live this <coughs> lifestyle. You want to get somebody upset? <coughs> Sir, your lifestyle is terrible. And I'm not your wife and I'm telling you this. <laughs> Would you be upset? Yes. What do you mean? What you mean? So, so John the Cross comes and tells his fellow Carmelites in Toledo, Spain. You know what they did? Lock him up. So what did they do to old John of the Cross? They whipped him. They beat him. They barely gave him anything to eat. They put him way up in the attic, cold, dark, yeah. and... He entered, and you probably heard John the Cross, the dark night of the soul. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if he didn't have that experience, he wouldn't have wrote that book, which, which has become a classic. And, and the Blessed Mother kept appearing to him. And then he tied all these sheets together, and he escaped. He went down, and he ran away, and he, he had to talk to St. Teresa of Avila. I mean, and then when they both met each other, you know what they did? We were in that spot, too, and they both levitated. And can you just see all the nuns looking and all of a sudden two people go floating up in the air like... And what did she want to do? She got, she got converted at the age of 40. She was a Catholic all her life, but she really started to say, I need to be transformed. And until you reach that point, you're not going to influence a lot of people's lives, brothers and sisters, until you're transformed. And lifted from glory to glory, as 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18 says. You're going to be lifted up and be transformed. So now Paul comes, and here we go again. Look, but look at the time. How, how many know that time went really quick, didn't it? And look how much suffering he had to do, not knowing. So with all of his preaching and, and everything else that he did, and going around all those 
pre three previous missionary journeys that we've been through. Now he's stuck in Caesarea. So he, by Caesarea, put down a two-year-old stint there. They asked him, verse 3, as a favor to him to Jerusalem, for they were plotting. Festus, uh, he said, verse, uh, verse 6, after spending no more than eight or ten days with them, he went down to Caesarea, and the following day took his seat on the tribunal. Okay, does that sound familiar? Take a seat. What's the name of Pilate's seat? Gabbatha, do you remember that? Remember, it was like a little portable chair, and you could bring it out. You sit it down. When Jesus came in, he sat down on the Gabbatha, the judgment seat. So now notice it says here that it took the seat. Is this very similar to Jesus? Yes. Do you see the details? Yes. They're, they're, they're right up front, close and personal here, aren't they? When he appeared, um, order that Paul be brought in, verse 6, verse 7. When he appeared, the Jews who had come down, see, so come down again, from Jerusalem, surrounded him, brought many serious charges. This is two years later. Talk about a court system. Maybe we have the same problems, huh? Uh, and serious charges against him, which they were unable to prove. So, what does it mean they aren't able to prove? We can't have, have two witnesses that agree. Mm -hmm. And j just these past few hours, this past month, uh, four teenagers just dropped uh, a sandbag on a car and they killed the person. And then there was another one, they threw a rock, killed a person. The same past month, this past month. And, and uh, interestingly, I heard their plea. Innocent. innocent. You, you drop a sandbag on somebody and you're innocent for killing a person? So, and even the other one, they claim innocence. Interesting, okay? The Lord has helped them and help us. People are dead, but you are innocent, okay? Now, now we come to, uh, I believe, this is, this is the crux of really announcing Jesus to the Jewish people. You ever get to talk to Jewish people about Jesus? When he appeared, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem surrounded him, brought many charges, verse 8, in defending himself. How do you say defending? Apologia. Defending against the Jewish law or against the temple or against Caesar. Now, remember, why was Jesus killed? Because according to Roman law, he committed what? Treason. Because he spoke against Caesar. Lie, lie, lie. He did not. He said, give to Caesar what is Caesar. Give to God what is God. So he never spoke one word against the government. So that's why I got I to gotta be good when I speak against the government. We can talk about the government and what's going on later on. But never during a, a, a spiritual exercise. Amen? Do I hear amen? Amen. Okay. She says amen over here. Okay. That's very important. What's that? That's very important. Yes. It is. You're here for God and that's all I'm going to give us. Amen? Amen. So, um, here, here we can see a lot of power going through this, this whole meeting with Paul. A lot of players are. So what did Jesus die? Jesus died because according to Jewish understanding, Hebrew commandment one, commandment two, commandment number three. I am the Lord thy God. He called himself God. Um, I wish the Jehovah Witnesses would pay attention. He used God's name in vain. And he broke the Sabbath by healing people. So those three reasons, for those three reasons, he had to be put to death. Over here, the Romans had a very lame excuse. He committed treason by having a, a government opposed. And, and here's what Jesus said about his government. My government doesn't belong to this world. And so what did Pilate say? You're a loon in June. There's no other world. This is it. I am the king of the stars. What would I say? You're not, let this guy go. Amen? Let him go. So, those are the charges. And look at verse 9. Then Festus, wishing to ingratiate himself with the Jews, I've got to get in good terms with these Jews, right? Said to Paul and Paul, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand their trial before me and the charges? So here it is, Jerusalem, because Jerusalem is the what? The center again. Did he just leave Jerusalem? You mean go back another 64 miles? And Paul answered, I love this answer. I am standing before the tribunal of Caesar. Because he was a Roman citizen, he can say this, send me to Caesar. That's now, this is the point in Caesarea. And what does that Caesarea mean? Caesar. Send 
me to Caesar. Every Roman citizen had a right to go. Does everybody know within the Catholic Church system, we have lawyers too? Yes. Yes. Sure. If I ever felt badly treated, I could say, I, will, I can appeal to the Pope and to the tribunal. <laughs> and there are, there are lawyers that I could go to, to plead my case. So even in ecclesiastical circles, there's lawyers. Does everybody know that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, I, I've never been to one, and I don't know the full process there. And uh, so, but that, that does happen. Then he says there, verse number 10, I am standing before the, how do you say standing before? Resurrection. Okay. I am going to be resurrected in front of Caesar. Now, why did he say that? He says that because he wanted to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. Why did he say that? Because if you look at Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus the risen Lord says the gospel will be preached to the ends of the earth. Now see this book of Acts, Acts 1 to 28, it was accomplished. Because Paul went all the way to, to Rome and he goes to the, the top banana up there. And he says, I am a Christian. And you need Christ. Okay? And so what, what happens, and we talked about the resurrection again. Guess how many years he was under house arrest? Two more years. And how would you like to have been chained to Paul? Because they had shift guards every four hours. Glorio. Oh, Glorio. One day, Brother Peter, they wanted me to take me to Boston to see a tour of Fenway Park. And I said, I would like to see Fenway Park. But they said, there's only one condition. We will take you there, we'll pay for you there, we'll give you lunch. I said, well, that sounds pretty good. What's the condition? You must take a picture in a Boston jacket. Forget <laughs> one. <laughs> 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 I said, take my life. I can't do it. I can't do it. To take, and you got to say, go, boss. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. So, 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 no, I got in. I got in. They felt sorry for me. So, Paul now has to stand trial. And he says, and look at verse 11, I appeal to Caesar. Now, guess who the Caesar was? Not somebody really nice. Did you ever hear Nero? Mm -hmm. Everybody go, whoa. I mean, that man was nuts. Probably the nutsiest, the, the one who pre, who pre, uh, who was before him, the one who was before him that was beyond nuts. I mean, he was on a different planet with horses and everything else, and all, all the deviancies of sexuality was Caligula. And he only made it 18 months with his debauchery and everything else. And Nero was bad. And so now, can you see Paul? Let's put this in a little looser language. Send me to Nero. Oh, 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 oh. It's like going to Boston Red Sox and wearing a jacket, you know, Brother Peter. Oh, 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 oh. Now, how many think you would do that? How many would say, send me to the, the man behind the curtain, oh, the great and the powerful, right? And, and this is the greatness of this man. Yeah. He wasn't afraid to stand in front yeah, of fearless. Nero. Yeah. Send me to, and of course back then they called him Caesar. Mm -hmm. So he wouldn't say send me to Nero because you could get your head chopped off because he is Caesar. So when you stood in front of Nero, you say Caesar. Hmm. Yeah. hmm. Are you getting all this? Good stuff. And then he says there, uh, verse number uh, 12. Then Festus, after conferring with his council, said, You have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you will go. So from this point now, 
He's going to leave Caesarea. So get ready. We're going, we're going floating now. We're going to be heading toward Rome. But even that journey, when we cross the Mediterranean Sea there, it's not going to be easy. Because what Paul is, if you want to read about Paul's exploits, 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 25. Does everybody know he gets shipwrecked three times? We don't know all those three times. But we're going to read about one coming up where he's going to get shipwrecked a major time. So even going there, and guess what he does? He saves the prisoners after the shipwreck. Come on, i got to go to Rome. <laughs> when you are a believer like this and live your faith, you will have faith and strength to lead other people with amazing power in God. Amen? Amen. Are you ready for that kind of power? Yes. Do you want that power in the next year coming up? Yes. When... We're almost done here. We, we wrap up. Um, we're ready to wrap up. Uh, when a few days you passed, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived in Caesarea. So here comes another what? Trial. How many trials are up to now? Four. 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 See all the trials coming up? So he's bouncing from. Who do we have? The first one. Sanhedrin. Who's the first one that we just had? What's his name? The Elix. Who's the second one? Festus and Drusilla. Who's the third one here? King Agrippa. Now we come to Agrippa. So here we're coming, and we'll just we'll just start this. And he, he confronts Agrippa with the real meaning of the faith. So startling is this. He goes to where Jewish people never go before. And we will pick up there next week to tell you where he goes. We're Jewish, and I believe this is our secret to evangelize <laughs> Jewish people to the faith. Because they don't go here, even though they have a book like this. And he's going to challenge them to really go to somewhere they've never been before, even though they have this. So when you talk to Jewish people, tell them, no, you only. Tell him Isaiah 53. Amen. Did you ever do that, Brother David? David does because when he when David gets really hot on Facebook, he writes all these political things and everything else. And he calls the politicians. I hope Cosmolina is looking. Do you check him what he's looking? He calls all these politicians names and everything else. Do you hear him? Do you, do you hear him calling them names and everything else? How many books? You can say that again. <laughs> He does, I mean, he, and he puts it all over Facebook. Do you check what he says there? Yes, yes ma'am. How many books do the Jewish Bible have? The Jewish Bible has 39. It's, it's, they don't have the, the Catholic books called Maccabees, Wisdom, Ecclesiasticus, and Baruch. They don't have those books. They have the Protestant Old Testament. Yes, they have the Protestant Old Testament. So they just skip over those problems? They have it, but, and they study it, but not like Paul is going to challenge them to. <laughs> Paul says, I believe, in, I believe in the law and the prophets, but they don't go deep enough there. For example, see everybody in this room, when I, when I go around doing Bible studies, people say, What's, what Bible study do you want? What do they say to me? What's the number one they'll say to me? Revelation. Oh, yeah. um, you know how many times I, I preach Revelation? I'm not exaggerating. 23 times. Oh. Not exaggerating. Oh. I'm counting. It's wonderful. So, hopefully everybody is convicted to live righteously in the power of Jesus and the resurrection, yes? Uh, if anybody's interested in um, I, to come to dinner on January 1st, let us know. So if we have something, we will call you to make sure you, you are invited. Um, if you're not doing anything on that day, uh, if you're trying to figure out what your son's new name is and stuff like that, okay? So, uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, all God's people said? Amen. Amen. Father, we just ask your choices, blessings upon us in the power of the Spirit. And may we be bold to proclaim Jesus Christ as alive. May we continue to be men and women of the way, the truth, and the life. And may we not be ashamed of the gospel because the Holy Spirit will come upon us to show us and empower us to preach the gospel to all people. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, all God's people say amen. amen.
Good night, Miss Debbie. Amen, brothers and sisters. Father mentioned tonight.